Donuts are everywhere. We live in a land of too many donuts. <laughs> There are Krispy Kremes and Cronuts and Dunkin' Donuts. Thousands of Dunkin' Donuts coast to coast, right? Although you're not supposed to call them Dunkin' Donuts anymore. They dropped the donuts part last week. But donuts are everywhere, right? We love donuts. Literal donuts, these kind of donuts, and metaphorical donuts. I would define donuts, I'll ask you to define donuts as things that we find irresistible, that appeal to our base instincts, that we can't quite turn away, but may not be good for us in the end, or especially in volume. So, uh, people who make donuts, both virtual donuts and real donuts, they know this, okay? They know what they're doing and they know they've got us. Uh, Greg Mara, a product manager at Facebook, um, was describing the Facebook uh, donut problem and talking about the news feed, right? The news feed. And he was talking about it like this. He was saying, if you just watch people eat donuts, you're like, people love donuts. Let's bring them more donuts. But actually, what people might want every once in a while is not a donut, but a kale smoothie. In which case, Facebook thought, maybe we can give them some kale smoothies too. Well, they're working on that, right? They're working on, on their donut problem. But what's true at Facebook is true so many other places, right? It's true in our food system, literally. It's true in our cars. It's true in our entertainment. It's true in about our lives. Autoplay binge videos. Those are donuts. One-click shopping and two-day shipping, all for free, seemingly. Those are donuts. Social media. That is actually has the effect of making us antisocial. Donuts. And cities that are designed for cars instead of the people. Those are donuts. Donuts, as I said, are everywhere. So we live in this world, right? And it has been exquisitely designed, perfectly engineered to cater to our base instincts, right? To placate our fears, to beguile us into having just one more. That's the world we live in. But it's not good for our health. It's not good for our physical health. It's not good for our mental health. It's not good for our social health. And we can't blame the individuals for this, right? This is the world we've created. You can't blame 200 million Americans who might be overweight or obese or suffer from depression as if they have some kind of moral failing, right? It's not on them, it's on us. This is the world we've designed. In fact, if you look at the four cornerstones of our modern civilization, what I would call the food supply, shelter, our homes and communities, our transportation networks, our entertainment, all of them really have the net impact of hurting our health rather than helping it, right? They all have this default mode that leads to poor health. If you look just at the average American, okay, the experience of the average, typical, everyday American, there is no such thing, but let's just pretend, they make $34,000 a year, okay? They pay about $1,300 a month in rent. Clearly, the average American does not live in San Francisco. <laughs> they, uh, they commute about 30 minutes each way to work, so half hour there, half hour back. They watch about 10 hours of screen time a day, on average, so that's smartphones, uh, computer screens, and TVs. And they consume, on average, this average American, they consume about 3,600 calories a day even though the average American, on average, needs only 2,500 calories per day. So that's the typical default experience. And what does that lead to? Okay, what does that default average experience lead to? Well, let's look at it first. Here's your house. Here's the average house. Here's your car. Here's your desk. Looks charming. Here's what you eat. And here's where you go for fun. Here's what you do for fun. You go to your kitchen, which, of course, has a big screen TV, right? This is where we spend all of our time. There's a reason our kitchens and our bathrooms are the biggest rooms in our houses now. It's because that's where we spend our time. It's where the food goes in <laughs> and where it comes out. So, so that's, that default mode, that leads to this, right? It leads to what we could call the seven plagues of modern life. And they break down like this. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, those are really consequences of the body overwhelmed. Chronic pain, mental illness, and drug abuse, those are the body saying stop, right? The body looking for an out. 
and autoimmune diseases, the more than 80 different conditions that, like Crohn's or IBS, um, that are, uh, represent when the immune system is actually malfunctioning, those really are the body pushing back, fighting back against itself. So if that's what's going on, we have to realize what this is a consequence of. 50% of Americans suffer right now from one of these conditions, and half of the people in this room are going to die of one of these conditions. This is the world we've built. But this is not, I would argue, the human condition, right? This is not inevitable. This is not just what happens since we've gotten rid of most infectious diseases. This is not just how the body is supposed to die or supposed to decay. In fact, it goes in many ways, contradicts our basic biology. Daniel Lieberman, an evolutionary biologist at Harvard, talks about those conditions, those seven plagues, as mismatched diseases, where we've actually put our body in a context for which it is not suited on an evolutionary basis. And that is, in fact, the consequence that we've designed. Um, when you think about it, the, um, the average American going from that, that default mode into this zone, they, they actually... Um, let me just get my track of thought again. Oh, so, so the, um, these, these, the, the burden of disease, this burden of disease, these seven conditions, they actually affect the poor and the powerless far more than the wealthy and well-off, all right? But they affect all of us. This is actually the world we all live in. So what do we do? We spend about $200 billion on prescription medications just to treat these conditions. We spend about $200 billion in hospital costs per year to care for people in hospitals with these conditions. About $30 billion on drug abuse treatments a year. And Americans spend about $70 billion on diets. That's an even half trillion dollars. The diets, that kind of stuff works for some people, right? It works on a one-on-one -on -one basis. People who are going paleo or going gluten-free, in some sense, they're, they're kind of trying to turn back the clock to this world before the world we've created. And it works for some of them, right? You certainly get an earful if it does. We all hear about it. <laughs> but it doesn't scale, right? This is not a way to fix the problem. So I spent about the past 20 years, 20 years of my life, thinking about how we use data and design to tell stories, to tell stories that could help people make better decisions, often about health. And I spent about the past five years, I did that at, at, at Wall Street Journal, I did that at Wired, um, for about a decade. And now, I've spent the past five years working on healthcare technologies, trying to build the tools that could help people with better decisions. In that time, I've seen billions of dollars invested in healthcare, right? It's a big wave. But the problem is it's going at the wrong end of the pipe, right? It's going to where the money is, that half trillion dollars, but it's not going to where the problem is. We have to think about what different stories we could tell. I believe we have a different story we could tell about our cities and our communities and our civilization. This is not a problem for government. This is really a problem for the people in this room. This is a challenge to people in this room, an opportunity. Buckminster Fuller, the, the fellow behind the buckyball you, you heard about earlier, Buckminster Fuller was one of the crazy radical designers of the 20th century and is an inspiration to me. I named my kid after him. Um, he challenged us not just to think bigger, he posited this question, how big can we think? What is the capacity of us to engage in the hardest problems that face mankind, face humanity? And in this case, I believe we face a very big challenge indeed. I think we have to do nothing less than to rebuild civilization, all right? Redesign it, re-engineer it, so that the default leads to health. He gave us a strategy, too. Buckminster Fuller talked a lot about how the best way to approach problems is not to reform people, but to reform the environments in which we live, all right? That's the way to get things done. So let's apply some Buckminster Fuller thinking and think about these four areas of our civilization, okay? Our food, our shelter, transportation, entertainment. The first strategy that I would suggest is that people who are creating new products, who want to design for health, who must design for health, we try to make this irresistible, right? We try to make the healthy choice irresistible. We want things that don't, don't just make people uh, feel like they're doing better, but actually are better for them, right? We want to exploit the defaults. We want to think about nudge theory and other tools that we can do to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And third, we want to sweat the logistics. 
Health is, I always say this, health is a logistics problem, not a science problem. It's a matter of delivering the right goods and services and care to people at the right time. That's the nut. And so to tackle this problem, we need to be thinking about what we're creating and what we're building, not just in three dimensions, but in four, four dimensions. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Four companies. I'm going to run through some examples of companies that I think are doing this now. First is Appeal Sciences. They're this amazing company that's taking this problem of uh, access to food, access to healthy food. Okay? It's a problem a lot of people have talked about. And traditionally, the approach is to build more grocery stores in neighborhoods, right? To increase access by building stores. What Appeal Sciences is doing is they're taking another approach. They're taking a fourth dimension approach and thinking about time. They're actually making healthy, good, nutritious food last longer. So then it, when it does become available to people, it's there and on the shelf longer in a healthy state. That's food. In entertainment, I'll point us to Niantic Labs. So Niantic Labs is a company that's behind a company a lot of, or behind a video game a lot of you have heard of called uh, Pokemon Go, right? This was a huge phenomenon a couple of years ago, and a lot of people thought it was just a, a fad, right? This engaged gaming where people get out into their neighborhoods and start um, spelunking and, and trying to pick up whatever they were trying to pick up. Um, that was a huge fad, but this picture here is from this year. This is still going strong, Pokemon Go. This was in Santa Monica this summer. And importantly, Niantic is now taking these same principles of engaged gaming to a new game that's going to come out any day now. Uh, it's the new Harry Potter game. And that, I think, is a big deal, because it's going to change how our children think about video games and entertainment. It's going to make moving part of the proposition. In Shelter, I want to point to Ori Systems. Ori Systems is this amazing company that's using robotics to turn small spaces into multifunctional spaces so that a living room can transform into a bedroom and back to a living room with just the touch of a button. And this is going to change not just individuals' lives, right, how we, how we kind of work in our spaces or live in our spaces, but it's going to transform communities because it's going to allow us to live in higher density environments and have more contact with our friends and family. And in transportation, I want to point you to Lyft. Now, we've all heard about Lyft, and, and you might think of them as just the good guys in car sharing. Um, <laughs> But they've actually done some amazing things in just the last few months. Starting in July, they, started, they bought a bicycle company. So now they, they rent bicycles, right? That's part of their service. They now have e-scooters built into the system. Who doesn't have an e-scooter startup uh, these days? But they do too. Um, and finally, they've done this. They've started to build public transportation into their app. So that if taking public transit is the best choice, they want to nudge you towards that choice. And you might have to walk a couple blocks, but that may be the most efficient way to get there. This, I believe, is a big deal. So we need more examples, right? Those are some, some worthy examples, but we need more examples. I want this room to be the place where more examples emerge. So I want you to ask yourself, is my company or product or organization building for health, or is the net impact of it going to be more illness, more, more passivity? I'm going to give you a checklist of five questions, five questions you can ask yourself and evaluate what you're doing, right? And evaluate the companies and services that you buy by this checklist. The first one is, does it reduce the time, does my product or company or service, does it reduce the amount of time that people spend alone, right? Does it increase isolation or reduce it? Does it help people move more? Does it get them outside? Is it good for me and good for my friends or family and community, right? Is it not just an I win and you lose situation as so many products are? Here's a good one. Does my product make people feel better after they use it? And finally, do people benefit more the more they use it, right? Now, I'll give you a very simple way to think about this checklist. It's a, it's a one-stop rubric. I'm going to call it the donut test, okay? This is an application of one of my favorite little um, uh, principles in economics. It's called the marginal utility curve. It's a very simple way to measure the value or benefit we get out of uh, something per unit, per unit of a good or service, right? So, so bang for the buck, so to speak. And in the case of donuts, right, that first donut tastes great, right? We get a lot of pleasure out of that first donut partly because we know we shouldn't be eating it, but it gives us a lot of pleasure. The second donut, not so much, right? We still finish it, we still eat the whole thing, but it's not as satisfying as the first one. And by the third and fourth and fifth donut, 
we're actually chipping away at any value we get. We have to think about our companies we create, the companies we use, the products we use, according to the donut test. Do they yield a net benefit or a net negative? So this is a concept and an, an idea that um, I've been thinking about a lot over the last years, and we are now starting to turn it into an organization and a community. Um, we're calling it Building H. It's something that I'm doing with my friend Steve Downs, who's from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Steve talks about health not as a vertical market, but as a horizontal value. And I think that's something that we all need to think about. How can we internalize this proposition of building health into everything we do? I want to leave you with four examples of how we've done this before, right? This is a big deal. I know it's silly and almost crazy to talk about rebuilding civilization, but we can do it. It is within our means. 2,000 years ago, the Romans built aqueducts across hundreds of miles of the Roman Empire, bringing fresh water, clean fresh water, into their cities. 200 years ago, the cities of Europe and North America, they were torn up, really remade for public sanitation, right? To make sure that people had safe environments and safe neighborhoods that they could uh, use and live in. Transform the way we think about cities. 20 years ago, transportation engineers in the United States got religion, finally, about bicycles. And they started to build in networks of bike lanes throughout our cities. Now, I bike in San Francisco. We're not there yet. We have a lot of lanes to build, but we've made tremendous progress over the last 20 years. And just two years ago, Google's Sidewalk Labs started a pilot project in Toronto, where they're reconceiving the whole city to be built around the principles of sustainability and health. So that's 2,000, 200, 20, and two years ago. Today, it's your turn. Today, it's our turn to start building health into everyday life. Thank you very much.